my argument is it's not movies or television that created the stereotype of the sort of antisocial, mostly white male nerd. It's actually the tech industry itself that created this stereotype and then perpetuated it for decades. Gender inequality exists in, in every industry, but um, in, in technology, there's this unique power and responsibility. Um, uh, you quote Sheryl Sandberg um, early on as saying, when you write a line of code, you can affect a lot of people. Um, and you give some examples right at the start of the book about Siri and Apple Watch and things like that. Can you, can you talk about the impact of underrepresentation in our lives through the creation of technology? So I'll give you an example that I think we can all relate to. Ev Williams, the co-founder of Twitter, told me that he thinks if they had more women on their early Twitter team, that online harassment and trolling wouldn't be such a problem. Hmm. He said, when we conceived Twitter, we were just thinking about all the wonderful and amazing things that you could do with it. And, you know, also, yeah, you could use it to share what you had for breakfast. Um, we weren't thinking about how you could use the technology as a tool to harass people or troll people because he said most of the people in the room who were conceiving this product were white men, people who weren't used to being marginalized or harassed or discriminated against. I thought that was pretty powerful. Like imagine if the internet was a friendlier place. Imagine if Twitter was a healthier place. They, there could have been very simple changes in the, in the, the very early days of the product. Maybe it would have, wouldn't have been such a free for all. Can I ask you just to talk a little bit about how sexism and gender inequality in tech fits into this larger societal challenge? Now, one of the most sort of shocking interviews I did very early in this process was an interview with Michael Moritz, who is a very prominent venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. He works at Sequoia. And I said to him, quite frankly, you have no women in your firm. What are you doing about that? Um, and he said, well, we're looking very hard, but we're not prepared to lower our standards. And that comment just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like this investor seems to think that talented young women just don't exist. Um, how is it possible that in 44 years, you couldn't find a single woman to meet your very high standards? That is unacceptable. Venture capitalists are just one piece of the puzzle, but they are the ones writing the checks with an incredible amount of power over who gets a chance to be the next Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. Many people know that the first programmers were largely women, but somewhere along the way, the industry was completely taken over by men. And um, one of the stories that really, really gripped me, and I'm just gonna ask you to retell uh, a little bit for folks that might not be aware of it, is the story of uh, System Development Corporation and this now infamous Cannon Perry test. You are absolutely right that in the early days, um, men were predominantly the makers of the hardware, the systems and, and the computers and the mainframes that were making the tech industry tick. But you know, in the 40s and 50s, women actually played prominent roles in building the software of the computing industry. The women, for example, that programmed the you know track of, of, of the Apollo to the moon. But what happened in the 60s and 70s is that the tech industry was just exploding and they were so desperate for new talent that they started doing these personality tests and aptitude tests to identify good programmers. And these two psychologists, Cannon and Perry, um, came up with an index of a handful of different qualities that they believed made, made for a good programmer. One of them was a good programmer likes solving puzzles and doing math. Well, that made sense. Um, another was that good programmers, quote, don't like people. Well, <laughs> um, if you look for people who don't like people, the research tells us you'll hire more men than women. Um, and there is no research to support the idea that people who don't like people are better at this job than people who do like people. And we came to believe that that's what a talented computer scientist looks like. This guy sort of coding in his hoodie alone in a basement, um, which is absolutely not true. But it pushed and profiled women out of an industry that they were surviving and thriving in. Um, and unfortunately, that's the stereotype and the myth that persists today. In the book, obviously, it's it's a, a whole lot of uh, detailing of a bunch of really significant problems, but you also um, do talk to some uh, significant 
women leaders in, in tech, Marissa Mayer um, at the time, who uh, and, and you talk a little bit about some of the challenges she faced in Sheryl Sandberg. You also meet with and talk with women engineers and young girls who are studying coding. In, in all of the darkness here, what are some of the bright spots that you see in the industry? Well, I'm so excited because I got a new example today of a company that's really making change and it's working. Um, they've really doubled down on pay transparency and making sure that um, it's very clear across the workforce what the ranges are and how you can, you know, how far you can go, right? What you can aspire to, but also making sure that it's all public information, which is hard. You know, she said this is hard from an HR perspective, but she they say they have 100% pay equity across gender and race, which is pretty incredible. Um, but it's you know not only gathering the data, but making sure they're doing that year after year after year. Because if you just do it once, and you know just do one big audit, and you think you're done, well, a year later those gaps are going to start to creep back. And so you just have to be very intentional, and year after year after year intentional. Like the work doesn't stop when you do one pay review or you hire one woman to the C-suite or or the or bring a woman into the boardroom. We're not one and done. We have to keep going and be consistent and do this work over time or it's, or it's, it's not going to make a substantive difference. Thanks everyone who joined and listened in. And, um, and thank you once again for, for joining me today. This was really an amazing conversation. Thank you. And I get, I get, I get re-energized um, every time I have one of these conversations and my hearing from you has been just especially refreshing. So I'm grateful for that.